So, probably if I'm online, hello everybody. My name is Alexander. I work at Coffee Stain Publishing. I've joined like eight months ago. This might seem like a lot of time, but it really wasn't. But it's been quite a journey and I'd love to share what I've done, what I'm trying to do and what we have done as a company. Uh, so I'll start about a bit about of a bit about Coffee Stain. Yeah. So who we are? We are a publishing company who help a bunch of studios to develop and publish games. And I'd love to say that we really are not a kind of publisher who just takes a game that almost that is almost ready and just throws in a bit of marketing and just goes off and publish it. We work with our developers more closely than that. We start working with them years before release usually. So, uh, and that's important because that is exactly what enables me as an localization lead to take care of all the things we need to take care of for good localization long before uh, the release. So probably most of you heard about Valheim, but probably Deep Rock Galactic and Satisfactory are known as well. And we have a bunch of other games. So a bit about me. I have almost 15 years, like Anton said, more than 15 years, but actually it's almost 15 years of translation experience. I've done some volunteer uh, projects, and at some point I've decided to join a studio, a localization studio, as a project manager, and I've been working there for like four years, and ended up being a team lead of project managers, and I've got a bit of experience in sales. So. It's kind of goes this way. I know how it feels for a translator. I know how it feels for a localization studio to be in the middle between those, uh, between the client and the end translator. And now I finally <laughs> found myself in the product company, and it's very interesting. So I have a lot of experience with CAD tools and generally a lot of software because I'm very curious about that. I can do some Python development, so I'm writing my own scripts for automation, and I can understand some C sharp and C which helps a lot because you know Unity is C sharp and, and Real is C and I can just read the code and understand what's going wrong with the with any kind of text management or manipulation functions without uh, bugging the developers. And I always I've been always curious about UI and UX, typography and design in general, and I think it helps a lot as well because Text is part of the design. It's actually copy is design. So that's how it is. And Coffee Stain isn't kind of a centralized company. We don't have any sort of rules or technological stack that we make our teams use. So I'm working with Unreal, Unity, and maybe I'll be working with something else. There hasn't been any game in any other language or uh, engine other than Unreal and Unity, but there might be. Uh, there's another another feature we have for our games. Most of them usually go into early access before it is, and some of them spend like a year or maybe two years in early access, and that means that there's a lot of updates. Some text is being rewritten completely, some features are being redone completely, so, and we can update monthly, and that kind of makes my life harder, but, but at the same time, it's really interesting. And we tend to have loyal and creative communities, or rather, we tend to have communities that have this loyal and creative sub-community of translators, toolmakers, uh, wiki workers, like guys who do a lot of stuff for our projects. And we see that as a as the greatest asset we have. Like. It's the, those are the best people. Those are the people for whom we are creating those games, really. Um, usually we want in-game text and subtitles for like cutscenes and uh, videos, whatever, wh whatever appears in the game. We want this translated, all the text. Sometimes we also do marketing. Well, apparently we do store descriptions and stuff. Uh, but sometimes we do community things as well, and maybe announcements in the game news, depending on what we see. Uh, how much interest do we see towards a game from a certain region? And at some point we might want to add voiceovers in our languages, but I don't think we've done it yet. Maybe it was done before I joined. I'm not really sure. Okay, so the the most 
like the, the, the trickiest part of my job here is that we use professional localization alongside with community localization. And that's a challenge I'm working with all the time and I haven't solved it yet. And I don't think there is like one uh, size fits it all solution for this. So probably it's going to be for every project, for every community, there's going to be some sort of adaptation all the time. But as you can read in the slide, we use professional localization for things that we cannot like go give to the community, like the initial release before the game has been ever shown to anybody, um, maybe secret stuff before the big release. For example, if we will add story to a game at some point, it's going to go to a professional organization first because, well, we don't want to spoil this before we release. And of course, we have to use professional localization whenever we need things done on schedule and with guaranteed quality. Because community uh, translation is work of passion. So we cannot demand anything from those people. We can be thankful, and I will, I'll talk more, more about it later, but we cannot demand anything. Sometimes they will translate like 5,000 words a day, but then they might disappear from a project for a week because, you know, they have life. <laughs> and it's not their job. Uh, so it's tricky. And so community usually works in the game during early access, of course, because there's a lot of edits. And those are the people who know the game best. Like no professional will ever know the game to, like a player knows it. Some people have over a thousand of hours in the game and you can't beat that, really. Um, so yeah, that's the perk of community localization. Now, the languages. That's a tricky one as well, because we, like any company, we have uh, economic reasons to choose certain languages. And when we first choose them, we base this selection on our own experience, maybe on sales of the previous games in the series, or maybe previous versions of the games. And uh, some games, we announce them long before they are even going into alpha, so we can gather actual interest from certain countries. Like we have Song of Con Songs of Conquest and it's being developed this way. It's not even in alpha yet, I believe. <laughs> so the thing is, we know that there's a lot of interest coming from Poland and Russia. There's a lot of people on Discord from these countries. So we are adding those languages right from the start to the game. Um, that's how it works. And then if the game is translated by the community, we add basically any language they ask. In this way, we have over 45 languages in Satisfactory. Like we have Cornish, which is a uh, resurrected language. And there was a guy who just came up to us, um, messaged us on Crowd and, and asked us if we can add Cornish because he is an enthusiast. He's trying to create as much interesting and contemporary content in his uh, newly native language which is Cornish, and we were happy to edit, and he's working on it now. Um, like we also have Pirate English, which is hilarious, really. And well, no company would do this, but if community wants it, and if they are working on it, and we're happy to edit. And it's a lot of fun, really. Right now we're working with LSPs, uh, but we might build our own team of pros in the future, like Sasha and Pasha told, uh, in their presentation, it's the best setup when you really care about your product. You don't want a lot of middle middlemen uh, between you and translation team. So it might be, it might happen, it's, but not now. Platforms and tech. We use Crowdin as a main platform for anything that is community-based, because I think uh, there is no other tool that is as good and also allows community translations. Like Crowdin is not the most powerful cat tool on the market, like MemoQ can give you a lot of features and if you if you know how to use them, <laughs> of course. But Crowdin is good and they develop really fast and I must say this, their support is the best in the market. Like I've worked with a lot of cat tools and I've had to communicate with a lot of support uh, they're not good, let me put it this way. And Crowdin is just amazing. They are just beautiful. So, yeah, but as you can see, we have different teams, and some of them have their own solutions. 
maybe they're using Google Docs and they don't want to move things into Crowdin. We don't make them move into Crowdin, they just keep using whatever they are using. So we have to adapt a bit. Maybe at some point we will sell Crowdin to them, <laughs> but who knows. On the game side of things, we use built-in localization in Unreal because there is one, and it's pretty good. I mean, it's, it's really, it, it is fantastic. From a developer point of view, it is great. It just lets you uh, do stuff and takes care of like everything. You can translate text. You, it gives you live culture switching in runtime, so you can just switch the language with the hit of a button. You may know that this is the feature that uh, Disco Elysium has. And the thing is, it's a default feature of Unreal Engine. Any game on Unreal Engine can basically do this, like add a hotkey to switch between two languages. And that's what we've done in Satisfactory, for example. Um, it is a bit lacking from the point of view of a localization professional. I would love to improve it somehow. And I'll talk about this a bit on the next uh, one of the next slides. But it is there, so we're using it. Unity is less standardized because it doesn't have a default localization system built in. So it kind of does, but it's in beta and it requires a lot of setup. So I don't think a lot of people are using it. So we're using, some of the teams are using i2 localization plugin and I find it pretty good. And some of the teams are using this with a bit of additions from themselves. Some of the teams are using their own localization solutions. So in the end, we, what I do is I take a look at how it works and I give them feedback uh, about what should be improved for it to be usable, for it to allow good translations and good quality. And of course, I'm trying as much as I can to connect all the things uh, in the, those ecosystems via APIs or scripts or whatever, because it removes friction. It allows you to do things whatever you want. Uh, it's quick and it, well, it just helps you focus on what matters instead of just moving files around and fixing those errors and stuff. And also I'm adding some quality of life improvements. For example, on real, you might know this. Anybody who worked with an Unreal game might have seen this game PO file, which is essentially randomized. And that's how Unreal works if you let it use default keys, which are hash-based. And that results in essentially randomized file. It's a nightmare for translator when strings are just in random order. But you can fix it. It depends on what the project is. And well, it's not a also a one size fits all solution, but for our projects, it works. I can sort it by source reference, and so it groups strings that belong to one asset together, and it helps a lot. Now, I see my job as uh, sort of creating an environment for both myself, my teams here at Coffee Stain, developers, I mean, and producers. And at the same time, creating this just as good of an environment for the translators or translation companies we work with. It's not like I'm not using the metrics or something to go for quality or something, but I think it's a broad thing. Uh, and if you make things easier for people, if you remove friction, um, if you remove standards mistakes all people make in game development, you make things easier for your translators and they have more time actually translating your content and not asking questions or fixing your errors in source or telling you that this or that string is impossible to translate into their language. So it's just a quick list. The first one is simple, don't be an ass. Like don't do crazy concatenation. Don't do positional variables that cannot be moved around. Don't do stupid variable names like percent %s. Uh, don't tell your translators anything about what they are. Provide context and if uh, some strings do not have context, at least be there and answer the questions quickly. And fix the source mistakes your translators find. Um, I'm trying to write and share guides and best localization practices for my developers. And it's sort of a, and it worked really well. 
because what I've found is that at least my developers in, in Coffee Stain Studios and Coffee in um, what else? In Vaulted Sky, well, all of the companies we are working with as a publisher, I found that those developers are not some evil people who just hate localizations, who hate translators, and they do things wrong on purpose. <laughs> like, of course, it's not true. They actually care a lot about their product, and they just don't know. Most of them just don't know how localization works, what kind of problems uh, they create for translators, because they're using the patterns they're using in programming, in development. And those are things they're used to. Concatenation is just what you do naturally in development. It just works and it's fine. But when you explain to them how this affects translation, they realize it pretty quickly. Like you give them one example and they, oh shit, I've been doing this for so long and people must hate me for this. And they stop and they realize uh, that they should do this differently and they just do this differently. So a simple explanation, a simple story about how translators work, like a tour around the CAD tool explanation of translation memories and term bases and what translators see, like the very fact that they don't see the blueprints, the UI is a revelation for a lot of developers and they realize that they have to add context. They have to comment on strings. They have to explain variables. They have to give them good names because that's all translators see. Um, so this works really well. And the same works for community, because community people, they are not stupid. I mean, they're not doing those translation mistakes because they're silly. It's just because they don't know things. They don't know, they, they have never been trained to work with a CAD tool. They have never been trained in some translation, I don't know, intricacies, like how to deal with things that are really, really, really hard to translate. What ideas can you pick up from other languages, from different, I don't know, translation? Well, they, have, they have no training. And if you give them some, uh, they start to really shine sometimes. Not everyone is interested in like training and translation. For some of them, it's just a hobby that they don't want to spend too much time. The, the, the most the most interesting part for them is that it is for the game they love and they don't really uh, want to spend a lot of time on the translation intricacies, intricacies themselves. But most of them are pretty interested in this. So that helps as well. Like, like I said, explain translation to developers and development to translators. And the last one I've picked up from my community managers because they've told me that that is what they do. They kind of bust me about development, game development, all the time, because they have to explain to people why they cannot implement this or that feature right now, like why it takes so long to do things that seem simple from the outside. And it's exactly the same for me, I guess. Sometimes I have to explain why can't we change this or that phrase quickly, because sometimes it's like hard-coded a bit, sort of, some logic depends on it, and changing just a few of uh, a few wrong words would lead us to rewriting quite a lot of code. And this is not really a priority. <laughs> you have to explain this stuff. And when you do, most of the people relate to this. It's like if you just tell them to go away, they will be angry at you. But if you explain them why you can't do this right now, then things start to get better. Um, that's part of a sort of a, an advice uh, which worked very well for me with Coffee Stain Studios. I basically became become a part of the UI and UX team of the project. I've been on all localization, all the UI reviews. I've seen uh, UI sketches long before they were implemented into the game, even for testing. So it's a very, very good time. It's a very good timing for you to, uh, as a localization professional, for you to kind of give feedback. Like, hey, this is not going to work in Russian because you've left no place for the uh, for the translation to fit there. Like English, Russian would be like 20% or maybe 50%, or like twice as long as English if it's a couple of short words. They can easily be twice as long. So, and it's a allows them to redraw the UI sketches before they've spent 
too much time on implementing them into Unreal and the game. So yeah, on Parallel you have to fix problems and make quality of life improvements. Otherwise, why am I here? <laughs> the next important thing I've picked up is communication. If you are managing something or someone, some people, it's more about communication than technical stock, really. So communication is really important. We have Discord channels for translators, and it's a bit about, it's a lot about communication, and it's also a bit about recognition, which I'll talk about later, because it's a separate status, and people know that if you're a translator, then you're helping the game, and it's it goes, it comes with some respect, really. We have, as a rule, we have to have direct communication with someone on the development teams who knows the, pro the project really well. For satisfactory, it's me, because I know the project uh, really well. For other games, those are probably lead developers, because or someone on the development teams who knows the project as a whole. And those people have to understand they have to spend time answering the questions and talking to people, because that's, well, they just have to do this, otherwise it won't work. And apparently we are setting up some kind of feedback uh, channels to get feedback from our community, especially from translation community, because those people have found a lot of mistakes in source text. They have find mistakes in, uh, like, logical mistakes, like um, the lore mistakes, stuff like that. It's the, it's the greatest asset you can have as a copywriter. People who love your text and who are very, very attentive to it. So we set up like Trello, maybe Jira, whatever the development team is using, really. You have to make it convenient for both parties. So you pick up a tool that the development team is using and you find a way to integrate it into some kind of form or something else that would be really convenient for the community. Because people should have as few problems reporting your uh, issues as possible. Now, in some projects, we have sort of organically uh, grown <laughs> ambassadors, like two people from the Deep Rock Galactic community became sort of ambassadors for translation community, sort of a liaisons between the development team and the translation community as a whole. And they have closed inside a group for more translators. And it works really well for them. Um, we might implement this in other communities, but that's something that, in my opinion, has to be organic. You can't just go and appoint a couple of people like you are going to be, you are going to manage it. You're going to be a manager for the community, sort of an ambassador. It doesn't work this way, in my opinion. So yeah, and to end this slide, I'd like to say that as a lock manager in a company like this, I feel like I'm a more of a diplomat sometimes than a manager because I have to be a liaison between the community and professionals. And we all know that professionals sometimes are really arrogant, like they know stuff. They don't want some community schmucks to tell them how to do this. But at the same time, they miss um, this um, very thing about community because those are, first of all, those are the players. Those are the end clients of everything we do. Like we do the game for them and the translators are actually translating the game for the very same people, for the community at, at large. And they also forget that community knows the game much better than any professional translator will ever do. So you have to be diplomatic. You have to bring the best from both parties so that they would complement each other instead of trying to kill each other. Okay, community. And it's not about community, really. I've been drawing this light uh, thinking that it will be about community, but in fact, it is about translation as a whole. Because in our industry, it most of the times, it is a rule that you will never appear in credits. Nobody will ever mention that you worked on this project. And there are exceptions, of course, like Simple is a great one, and there's a bunch of game development studios that have sort of a rule to 
credit the companies, the people they've been working with on localization, and that's great, but uh, those are exceptions. So recognition is a big part of what you can do for translators, and I'm trying to do this as much as I can. Some of the projects have reward systems, like they're more structured, you know the numbers sort of, you know the rewards for every tier you uh, have, like game keys being added to credits, and maybe the top tier for Deep Rock Galactic, as far as I remember, they send you a t-shirt, which is pretty neat. Um, but as a very basic thing you, I think I have to implement for every game is to add all the translators to credits, both professionals and community. Another thing is that you have to act on whatever those people tell you. Like you have to fix errors in source, you have to fix issues with UI and well anything they report you with these, which is legit issues, legitimate issues, you have to fix it. Otherwise it's, well you, if you have translated something you understand that uh, when you work on a project that has quite a lot of errors in source and you report them and you report them for a week like maybe two weeks and you and you see no reaction from the client at all you understand that they don't give a damn they just don't care and you stop doing it so don't be that client is what i tell myself just don't be this guy this bad client act on what people tell you and let them people let them track progress on their reports and suggestions. It's something I'm working on. It's not that good, but I think I have to do this. It's just my way of giving back to the community for what they do for our game. And yeah, it's sort of an advice to anybody who finds themselves in my situation, like their first job as a product in a product company as a organization manager. Ask your community managers. They will have an advice or two about how to work with people because that's what they do. And well, here's a bit of an example of the niceties we've been working on. This idea is a test language, basically, and I'll skip to the next slide to show you like how it works. It's the idea is simple. Give every string a unique simple ID as translation so that it will be easy to remember and look up and give players and community members the ability to switch to this debug locale with an easy easily like a console command or a help key and what it does it helps you and identify strings exactly even repetition have different ids in this locale and it shows you all the variables and concatenations you see how the string is constructed because in a game you will never get away from concatenation completely you can get away from crazy ones, like stupid ones that will never work, but you will always have variables, you will always have placeholders and formatting and all those kinds of things. It's just inevitable. So this mode kind of shows you how this works. And also it spotlights the strings that are not expertly for localization, because, well, if you if a string doesn't change to this uh, simple ID, then, you, then it, that means that it isn't localized. Okay, so here's how it looks. Like on the left, you see that how it looks in English locale. Then you switch to the one, to the debug one, and you can. Uh, and the rightmost uh, picture is how it looks on Crowden. These uh, IDs are added to the context of the string, so you can easily find it. And it's just four digits, so you can just remember it and type it. And I have to make a screenshot even. And as you can see, it shows you the structure of the string, like produced in constructor workbench becomes a Pretty complicated string because that's how it's built. <laughs> and that's something we are going to fix probably. <laughs> but anyway, you can see how it works. And I think it's available for LQA and the feedback from translators was really nice because it simplifies reporting and simplifies finding strings. Because some of the community translators work in a way that professionals never do. They play the game in their own language and they see a string that is not translated and they just switch to this locale and they find this string on Crowdin and they translate it. It's not like they're going through the whole file in one go. They just don't do it. They, well, maybe they do it at the beginning, but then they just play the game and translate any untranslated 
text they spot. And this mode really helps them find the exact string they see on the screen. And yeah, I have a lot of ideas <laughs> about how to uh, kind of improve life of everybody involved. One of them is a quick UI language. The idea is to let my UI teams quickly test or really actually break their UI with any uh, long, short, or like long as word heavy text. The thing that long as word heavy text is basically German. And German breaks every UI I've seen. Um, so that, that, that's one of the ideas. Then another one is I'm really, really eager to improve the Unreal localization system because it's really good for developers, but it would be much better uh, for localization specialists and developers if it kind of had the ability to combine string tables with an integrated UI to work with them right from the assets and to add comments and like to collect usage references from for CSV ta string table entries as well. But I cannot do it myself. It requires a lot of C++ black magic. So that's something we are going to do as a company at some point, I believe. And yeah, I'm, I've been doing a lot of uh, localization sort of reviews. What I call them is it's when I dive into the project and I open it in Unreal or Unity and I go over the assets, I go over code and try to find as much text-related stuff in the project as I can just to kind of assess the current situation and prepare a checklist with, uh, with real examples from the project with real solutions based on this project and on the engine they're using. And that's what I've been doing. It works really well. And I would like to create sort of a tailored checklist tailored to Unity and Unreal in general and maybe publish them for the teams and for maybe well, everyone. Okay, I guess uh, that's it. And if I have to sum it, uh, the first one would be be a good client is what I'm trying to be. Because I've seen it, I've suffered a lot <laughs> as a translator and as a project manager in the agency from clients who don't give a damn about their project, who are slow to respond, who never really answer any questions, never fix any errors. And I've seen this ruining perfectly well translation processes because it all depends on the client in the first place. So I'm trying not to be this client. And, and I found that really useful to talk to people as simple as it sounds and trying to explain things how things work for the other side, how things work for translators, for managers, for developers. Yeah, and I'm trying to automate, connect, and do some cool stuff because it's fun and I love development as much as I love translation. And well, I believe strongly that pros and communities can work together if you can keep them from killing each other. And that's, I guess, what I'm trying to do.